But I think one of the really, really important things to understand about ourselves is that I think we are, we are processing information in our minds in a totally different, mm. a new and different way. Sure. And we began to do this even within the tenure of our own um, anatomically recognizable species, Homo, Homo sapiens. You know, Neanderthals had big brains, yes. But I think they were, they were big brains that were working on an old ancestral intuitive algorithm whereby intelligence uh, on, a, on, a, on a sort of implicit scale was, was scaled up with brain volume. And uh, we don't process information that way at all. We, we uh, de deconstruct the environment around us mm, into, sure. a, into a vocabulary of mental symbols and then we recombine these symbols. Uh, to imagine new versions of the world that we live in. Yeah. And, yeah. and we do remake the world in our minds. Wait, to well, let me just see. So you're saying that the reason why humans survived and Neanderthals didn't is we had symbolic uh, uh, communication or, or a process and to... And planning capacities, yeah. And, and Neanderthals didn't? This is right. I thought there was... Melanie? Well, well that's one hypothesis. Um, <laughs> Where do I where do I start with this? <laughs> I mean, that's like that's why why we are still here and the Neanderthals are extinct is like kind of you know one of the top five questions in paleoanthropology. I think so. There's this idea that you know we are very similar to each other. Um, you have Neanderthals inhabiting much of Eurasia, very low population densities, but, and then but isn't that critical? Isn't it critical that they have such? Population. So, I mean, well, they that's never, why they never you know there are abundant. right that yeah. there are a number of alternative hypotheses. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's a basic principle of competitive exclusion, right? Sure. Like if you have two very similar species, they need the same things, they want the same resources. When you put them in the same environment, sure. inevitably one of them either turns into something completely different or it goes extinct. It's a general rule and rule in evolution, right? Sure. Rule. I don't know if I should be using that word, but um, you know. We have fossils, we have a little bit of ancient DNA, you know, nothing like a comprehensive sample of what gen genetic variation looked like back then. And we have a lot of stone tools and some other artifacts. And so it's suggestive of things like, you know, we don't see a lot of really good hard evidence for symbolic behavior for the Neanderthals. So there, there's some later mm -hmm. stuff that could be argued to be symbolic, like use of raptor talons possibly yep. as, as jewelry or feathers, feathers or sure. possibly body paint, possibly body paint, you know, so things when, like when, that. When we talk about symbolic, we're not talking just about making tools. We're talking no, about no, something No, no, we're talking else. about symbolism, like having signs that have meaning that is completely mm -hmm. abstract, like human language, which is the fundamental hallmark of human language. And so one of the major debates has been, do Neanderthals have this capacity or do they not? And that's a question that I think is really difficult to answer. Oops, sorry. From the archaeological record, um, there are there are there are modern human interactions that have happened in the recent historical past that, if we only recovered archaeological evidence for, you might make that argument for when it was clearly when it was clearly the wrong argument to be making. So um, it's it's difficult yeah. to answer these questions. It is a difficult question to answer, but I think I think what we see when and when symbolically reasoning Homo sapiens comes along, it's a totally, totally radical change in the relationship of the species to, uh, to the world. And um, in 50,000 years, or much less than that, really, and for most of it, we have managed to ruin the planet. You know, if, if, Neanderthals, if Neanderthals had been us, if they had had that capacity, they would have probably uh, uh, at least left some kind of a mark that would be indicative of that. And basically, we don't find that in the in so inflect sort of inflection in the uh, Neanderthal record. Do we know why humans developed this symbolic capacity? And uh, we seem to be, as far as we know, the only species that has. And but what are, was it about are, our, are, our evolutionary word, history that uh, <laughs> that led to that? Well, uh, dare I utter the word random? <laughs> um, I, I, I think I'm going to have to in this context if you're asking this question because, you know, essentially you have to have a structure uh, before, you can, before you can use it in a new way, okay? And uh, I, Simon's talked about this, the recruiting of, uh, of, of, of biology that's already there to a new uh, to new uses is really what lies at the at the basis of meaningful evolutionary change, and so we had to have before we could start 
behaving in this strange new way of ours, we had to have the biology that allows us to do it. And therefore, the biology must have been acquired in some context that's completely random to the way that we're using it. Now, does that make logical sense to you? Simon? Uh, no. <laughs> OK. Well, sort of. <laughs> no, I, mean, okay. it, well, I, I, I if, if this was a viva, a boat cheek, you know, I would say, come on, come on. Um, what was this random thing which happened? And, and I don't think, I certainly don't know, and that might be shared by you. Uh, and that's not an accusation. It, but I'm not persuaded by it as a metaphysical argument um, because um, what happens with us, and again, it's really the sort of tightrope between the sense that we just live in a world full of absurdities. We, we make sense of it in one way or another, uh, but it's really just hanging on for grim death in a, a very sort of distressing but I mean, apart from anything else, I think our, uh, 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 when we realised that we were mortal, it was pretty shattering. I don't look forward to it myself <laughs> either. But, um, but I, I'm more persuaded, though, that <clears throat> if you like, and using mathematics as perhaps the, the stalking horse here, is that um, there's a wonderful essay by uh, Gene Wigner, which I always refer to in my lectures. Uh, he, I believe, was uh, a distinguished mathematician in Princeton down the road. And the, the essay was The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. He said, why is mathematics so remarkably effective? And why is it that something which doesn't exist, complex numbers, uh, suddenly has traction in all sorts of physical problems? And he started to sort of wax lyrical. And there's a rather similar set of conversations with Ramar Arjun as well, the distinguished Indian mathematician, where these things are discovered. And I think myself that, and this is fantasy, of course, um, if you then say, well, these boundaries which we've gone through may be at one level random, why not? It could simply be the accident of that history which took us there. But the things which we then discovered are absolutely real. They're not our inventions. And that, I think, partly explains why our cultures are so interesting. 